Let's talk about the pattern tool located in Transform. I'm going to drag a static mesh actor into my workspace and select pattern. It's going to give me a line by default. I can also generate a grid or a circle. Within the circle, I have control over the count, the radius, whether or not I want the objects to be oriented to the circle or to maintain their original orientation. You get some similar kind of stuff here with line. We have centered versus not centered. You can see it's spotting them in a direction away from the input geo or it's using the geo as the center and spawning in either direction. You can change the axis, a little more meaningful here with the circle option. So we can change which plane we're using as our pivot. And if I'm happy with all this stuff, let me actually set this back to the, to the default for the circular configuration. I'm gonna hit accept here. What I've just generated is a pattern object it's technically a static mesh actor and it has a bunch of static mesh components associated with it. I can modify the piece of geometry that is being used by any of these static mesh components if I want. But there's a limitation here and that limitation is this geometry can't be used in a Boolean operation. So I'm going to select the ground plane, which I think is actually a cube, and go to model. You see there's our Boolean tool. If I select my pattern object as well, Boolean is not available to me. So what I need to do is hop back over to my pattern tool, scroll down to the bottom and enable convert to dynamic. If I do that, you'll see I don't have any of those static mesh components. I now have a dynamic mesh actor and it is now valid for use in Booleans. So if I come over to model, now Boolean is available to me and I can use this to punch holes and things. Let's back out of that. You're not limited to using one object for your inputs. You can use as many as you want. So if we go back to transform and pattern, you can see that we are getting now all those same controls, but we can operate on a collection of objects here. If I hit accept, it's going to go ahead and do the same thing in terms of generating a pattern, but it's going to make a pattern for each one. So it doesn't combine them. You could probably combine them at the source and if all of these were merged and you did a pattern with it. There is one feature that appears to be broken though. It's got some promise, so it's worth keeping an eye on. And that is, let me go ahead and increase the count. So if you come over here to randomly pick elements, then you can begin to get some kind of interesting stuff here. So if you wanted to, you know, create some kind of a circular configuration of random rocks and sticks and whatever, put a little fireplace in the middle of it, this would be a useful way to go about doing that, except when you create the geo, it loses that information. So it doesn't seem to be working for some reason. Well, it's possible I'm doing something wrong, but it has a lot of promise. So, you know, maybe in a future version of Unreal, this is 5.3, they will have that fixed and you can use it in your world building because I think it would be a pretty convenient feature to take advantage of. You could probably also get a little bit crazy or you so inclined by using the pattern itself in a new pattern. Get a little bit wild here. I'll reduce the countdown a bit. You start making some interesting procedural stuff there. So anyway, pattern, really cool, very useful, and definitely something that you want to have in your back pocket. Let's move on to the deform menu. We'll begin with vertex sculpt. If you have used ZBrush, this will look familiar. We have some basic sculpting functionality. Left mouse button will sculpt the surface up. Holding control will sculpt the surface down and shift will smooth out whatever sculpting you've done. There are controls for different brush types. You can see a variety here. Flatten is also pretty useful. You kind of see how that works. We'll head back over to sculpt normal. You can modify the alpha if you want to throw a mask on there. I don't think I have anything in here that would make a lot of sense, but easy enough to play with that. I don't have a dense enough poly mesh to really demonstrate that anyway, but you could throw one in if you were so inclined. You can also turn on lazy mouse if you want to get some stroke averaging. You can control whether or not it is symmetrical. You can control the strength and the fall off of the primary sculpting brush. You can control the strength and fall off of the smooth operation, and you can turn on the wireframe. We're, we're dealing with a pretty low poly mesh, so the actual result here that we're getting is gonna look fairly faceted, obviously, but it's enough to demonstrate the functionality here of this tool.
I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of that. The next thing I want to talk about is Dynamic Sculpt. With Dynamic Sculpt, I think by default the wireframe is going to be turned off. The assumption here is not that you want to modify existing geometry, but that you want to create new geometry. So, and there's no symmetry for some reason. It's just how it is. But uh, you can see here that I'm able to pull off geo and it's not distorting existing geometry. It's generating new geometry. So in this, in this context, it's pretty easy to see how this could be useful for vines or roots or that kind of thing. Uh, I'm just going to hit undo a couple of times. We'll look at a few other options. We have smooth, which probably in this case won't really do much because it's already pretty smooth, but you can do this sculpt normal thing, which is going to look very similar to the other sculpt, but it gives it like a little bit more of like a kind of a cool blobby feel. Uh, we have a flatten here, plain normal, which wherever you select first, it'll go ahead and sort of snap everything to that plane. So you can kind of get something that looks a little bit like that and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things in here that are kind of cool and worth taking a look at. You know, something in here that just seems to introduce like a little bit of, of noise. Also, this mesh isn't very dense. So there may be some things here that are cool if you're dealing with a, with a more dense mesh. But anyway, definitely good to know about. Let's go ahead and hit cancel out of that. Now, one of the things that has been a limitation for both Vertex Sculpt and Dynamic Sculpt is our mesh density. There are a few options here out of a wireframe, right? So you can see approximately how dense it is. You can always create a denser version of the mesh if you're dealing with, you know, a primitive here. I can I can set my subdivisions to some higher number. You can also come over to mesh and remesh. What remesh is going to do? Let me turn on that wireframe real quick. Actually, I think there may be a wireframe option in here. Oh, it's just going to show by default. So it's going to pick some number that it thinks makes sense, but you can give it a much higher number, right? So right now it thinks 5,000 is a good number, but if I want really fine detail, I could set this to 100,000 without too much trouble. We'll hit enter there. Let it process for a moment. And now if I hit accept, I have a piece of geometry that is significantly denser. You can see it appears as though I've baked some of my low poly in here, which is exactly what happened, but it's, it's uh, preserve the UVs. There's another option we'll be talking about that is a voxelization operation that will nuke the UVs, but it has some of its own advantages that we'll be talking about in a minute here. But if I wanted to get rid of this uh, low poly that's baked in here to my high poly and go back to deform and we can look at smooth. So we have now cleaned up our geo, but you can see what it's done with the UVs. They've gotten a little bit wobbly. So if that's a problem, just something to be aware of. I'm going to go ahead and accept here. This is obviously going to be a much heavier mesh in terms of its size on disk. Another thing to be aware of. But now we can go back and, oh, I don't know, we'll take a look at Vertex Sculpt. I'm going to turn the wireframe off. And now as I'm sculpting on it, you can see I'm getting something that is much smoother. But because this mesh is no longer symmetrical, symmetry is no longer enabled. There is another option for adding density to your static mesh. If we go to model, we have this subdivide tool. I'm going to create two spheres because there's a little bit of a gotcha with this process. By default, this is going to be a sphere with 3000 triangles. If I go to model and then subdivide, the first option here is going to be the Catmull Clark subdivision scheme. And one of the conveniences here is you can actually access lower down subdivisions if you're familiar with the concept in ZBrush, if there are already existing subdivisions on your mesh. But as you can see, it makes your mesh smaller. So that's not wildly useful. You can also use loop. If I set this to one, we are going to effectively add one subdivision to the geometry. So I'll go ahead and hit accept there. So I don't know which one that was, but we now have 12,300 triangles as opposed to 3,000 triangles. So we've exponentially increased the number of triangles. Each triangle on the original mesh is now four triangles. The gotcha here is where we go to deform and then grab vertex sculpt. Our symmetry now has been modified. It's been recalculated and I cannot figure out how to correct that orientation of what axis is using there for symmetry. So if we look at the original here, Vertex Sculpt, 
the symmetry is going to make a lot more sense. It's going to be positive or negative on the x-axis. So anyway, that's a thing, certainly a thing to be aware of. You can preserve your symmetry. Well, you can preserve some form of your symmetry. I think one of the reasons this may be a little more complicated for the automatic symmetry detection algorithm is it's symmetrical in a lot of different ways. So if you're using a piece of geometry that wasn't, maybe it would have less of a challenge there. But I took a look at this and basically it just says this is something that's based on whether or not the geometry is symmetrical, but poking around I don't see any way that we can modify exactly what axis it's using. And uh, freezing the transforms doesn't seem to have an impact on it. So anyway, just a thing to be aware of, but certainly a convenient way to add additional subdivisions to your geometry if that's what you need to do. We can also reduce the number of polygons. We go to the mesh menu. We have a simplify tool and it's pretty convenient, pretty easy to use. It's going to give you options for how you want to reduce. You can set a specific triangle count. You can set a percentage of the current triangle count. You can use vertex count, or you can use edge length. And so these kinds of things are, are actually pretty useful, especially in the context of geometry scripting. We're at time for this video. In the next one, we're going to talk about a few more things here in deform, warp, displace, lattice. We'll get to voxels and hopefully UVs. So we'll see you there.